Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. Thank you for your prayers for Audrey. Uh, you know, she's contracted Lyme's disease, and uh, she's better, and uh, she's going to go see the infectious disease doctor on Tuesday. But we already feel like that she's on the other side of it, healed of it, your prayers, and the uh, good work of doctors at the hospital. And so we're thankful for that, but keep praying a little bit longer. So we appreciate that. want to give you that little bit of an update on her. And thank you so much for that. Uh, we are in Ephesians 3 this morning. If you've got a Bible, you could turn there at this time. Good to see you all. Welcome to the morning worship of Oak Grove Baptist Church. This evening our deacons will be meeting and the church will be open if you'd like to come and pray. Sometimes people just like to come and pray. And the this evening the church will be open for that at any time if you have a need or would just like to come and sit in the quiet and pray to the Lord. That would be a good time for that. We're getting ready to crank up our fall schedule. There's lots of announcements in the bulletin about that and different things going on. Be in prayer for that and those things that would apply to you or concern you or you'd be interested in as we transition over the next month into the school year schedule. This morning I just want to read a couple of verses here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. The title to this message is God ability. God ability, it's a hyphenated, created word that I made up to talk about this passage in a specific way. It's something that I got inspired to do because it's something that Paul does here. It's something that Paul does quite often. He's writing and he gets to talking about God and the person of God and the work of God and the awesomeness of God, and he runs out of words. And that was a hard trick for Paul. He had quite a vocabulary. Paul was a scholar, academic, philosopher, theologian. He would have what we call today a double doctorate, maybe PhD, a THD, a doctor of philosophy and doctor of theology. And he was quite literate. Uh, half of the New Testament is written by him. And his Greek is what they call high Greek. There's different levels of Greek, just like there's different levels of English. And Paul's is very lofty. But oftentimes he's writing and he just sort of hits the wall. And he pulls out the dictionary and he pulls out the thesaurus and he just can't find words that are adequate to describe what he's trying to say. He runs out of words. <laughs> you ever run out of words? You ever had an experience where you just... You're speechless. I was thinking about this this week, and I thought about when my first child was born. I was speechless. I, didn't have, I couldn't say anything. Maybe you've had that experience. I was thinking about the time when Sherry and I stood and looked at the Grand Canyon. I never will forget that experience. Great big hole. <laughs> and yet there it was, and I just, I was speechless. Several years ago, I was in the Philippines leading the pastor's conference, and the pastor's conference began with me preaching a message, and so I preached the message, and then we had a breakout session where all the pastors sit around and ask you questions. And so I said, any of you men have a question? And one guy raised his hand, and he said, Pastor, he said, what does flabbergast mean? They all nodded their head. I had used the word flabbergasted. They never heard that word before. <laughs> so, so I had to try to tell them that I used the word flabbergasted because I talked about how God flabbergasts us. So that was a word that I created to try to describe what God does, and then I had to translate that word to the Filipino pastor. Sometimes when we try to talk about what God does, words just fail us. And that's where Paul is here. If you look at verse 20, he says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. Those three words, what Paul does in the original language is he takes three Greek words and he smashes them together. 
It's the word kata, which means above or beyond, and ek, which means out of, and then the word pariso, which means abundance. So if you translated it literally, it would be above and beyond out of the abundance. God is able to do above and beyond out of the abundance. David the psalmist said it this way, My cup runneth over. <laughs> And so Paul is talking about God's ability, his ableness. Uh, the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, says above and beyond. The NIV says immeasurably more. The NLT, New Living Translation, says infinitely more. I thought about Buzz Lightyear when I read that. To infinity and beyond, God's able to do. The New American Standard is probably the most literal translation, but it's also the most awkward. It says, God is able to do far more abundantly beyond. And then one of the paraphrases, I think it was the message, said, God is able to do beyond your wildest dreams. So everybody that tries to translate this phrase struggles with how to translate it. It's just Paul's trying to make up words, put words together to put into some sort of vocabulary, some type of verbiage, a way for us to get our minds wrapped around a little bit how God is able, how able he is. How able is he? I was reading one book, and they took this verse 20 and 21, and they put it in a pyramid. So think about a pyramid, and the pyramid starts at the top with the word able, and then he's able to do, and then he's able to do what we ask, and then he's able to do what we think, and then he's able to do all we ask or think, and then he's able to do above all we ask or think, and then he's able to do abundantly above all we ask or think, and then he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, all the way down. God is able. About 30 years ago, the Maranatha singers sang this song. He is able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. He is able, more than able, to handle anything that comes my way. He is able, more than able, to do much more than I could ever dream. He is able, more than able, to make me what He wants me to be. So God is able. Paul says that here. The Bible teaches us that God is able. And history records God is able, and our own experience tells us that God is able. Does everybody believe God is able? If you believe God is able, say, God is able. God is able. That's good, but that's not what Paul says here. <laughs> the title of this message is not God's ability, but God ability. It's a hyphenated, created word to get you to focus on the fact that usually when we quote this verse, we only quote half of it. And when you only quote half a verse, you get in a whole lot of trouble. Notice verse 20. Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, that's usually where we stop, there's no period there, comma, according to the power that works in us. So God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, accordingly. That's three adverbs. I know that's not good grammar, but it's great theology. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, accordingly. So I want us to think not about God's ability. Nobody questions God's ability. He's able. But it's God ability. And the principle of God ability is this. God is as willing as we are able, and God is as able as we are willing. I don't know if I can say that again, but I'm going to try, because some of you are trying to write it down. God is as able as we are willing, and God is as willing as we are able. David Ring, our evangelist friend, says it this way, God doesn't want your ability, God wants your availability. As we make ourselves available to God, His ability becomes our ability. That's what Paul's talking about. He says to the Ephesians, Ephesians, He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, accordingly, according to the power 
which works in us. And that's quite a power. It's more than the power of these lights or the power of, of, uh, of electricity or anything like that. It's the power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. That's quite a power when you think about it. One day dead, two days dead, three days dead, and then he's alive. That's quite a power. <laughs> and that's the power that's available to us. Availability is where God ability begins. Let me give you a couple examples in Scripture. Exodus 14, Moses comes to the Red Sea. Moses is followed by approximately two to three million Israelites, if you count the men, the women, and the children. Pharaoh and his chariots and armies are hot pursuit after them, and they come to this raging river, this raging sea, and God says to Moses, Moses, Stand still and see the power of the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Moses, raise your rod and I will part the water. Now, that doesn't make any sense to us, does it? But Moses raises the rod. He's available to do what God's called him to do. And Moses' availability is the access point for God's power to work on planet Earth. If Moses doesn't raise his, raise his rod, they're all dead under Pharaoh. But Moses raises the rod, and God responds with his mighty power. David. David and Goliath. 1 Samuel 17. You know why David was there that day? Have you ever read the story? David's mama says, David, take your brothers some biscuits. His big brothers were in the army. David was just a little teenage shepherd boy. Mama comes and says, take this to your brother. So David just shows up to deliver pizza. <laughs> He's just the delivery boy. <laughs> That's all he is. He's just being obedient to Mama. He's just doing what Mama said. And when he gets there, he hears something that does something. He hears this guy, he's about 10 feet tall. He's on the other side of the valley of Elah and he's hauling out insults about the God of the Israelites. And he says, send me a man that we may do battle. And all the soldiers are shaking in their boots, even David's big brothers and King Saul on top of it. And David said, what's this all about? Is there not a cause? Let me at him. <laughs> and the next thing you know, David takes a sling and a stone and he swings it into history. Why? He was available. He was just there. He was just being available and open. And the power of God became his possession because of his willingness to do what he was supposed to do. Peter and John, Acts chapter 3. They're new believers in Christ. They're believing in the resurrection. They're going to the temple that day just to witness and to share Jesus with those Jews who are going to the temple. And there's a man sitting outside the gate. He's lame in the legs and he's there begging He's there every day. Everybody knows the lame beggar. He's like the guy that stands by the corner of the busy intersection with a sign. Help. Need help. God bless you. He's that guy. And they walk up and he sticks his hand out expecting to get lunch. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. The man thought he was going to get lunch and he got legs. <laughs> And Peter, because he was available to share the Word of God, the miracle power came down in response to his availability to God. That's God ability. Our availability is where God ability begins. This is what Paul is emphasizing in verse 20. Unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, accordingly. Exceedingly, abundantly, accordingly. God is only limited by our limitations to believe Him, to trust Him, to obey Him, and to honor Him. And so the power that we're seeking, the power that we're needing, is available to us as we obey Him. That's the key concept in verses 20 and 21. Let me say these three statements. I said them for over 20 years now. Here they come again. For those of you that have never heard them before, God is still looking for faith equal to what He wants to do. God will do what you cannot do if you will do what you can do. Without Him, we can't. Without us, He won't.
That's my favorite. One of the greatest things God's ever taught me. Without Him, we can't. But without us, He won't. Unto Him it's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Availability is the beginning of God ability. Last week, if you were here, we talked about the uh, Apollo loon, lunar landing and communion on the moon. And I did a lot of research on the moon landing and Apollo, just something that's interesting to me. Read a lot of articles. And I saw one in Florida Today magazine that I was interested in. It was the 50th anniversary reunion of NASA there at uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida. And I noticed as I read this article, the keynote speaker for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing was a guy named Fred Hayes. And I thought, what? Fred Hayes? Who's that? You mean they're not going to have Buzz Aldrin? Neil Armstrong's gone on to his eternal reward. You know, he's, he's no longer living. They're not going to have the, the man that walked on the moon address the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, or Michael Collins, he was in the control module flying above, or Gene Krantz, he was the missions director, the whole thing, or the president or the vice president. They're not going to have those guys speak. Fred Hayes. And so I began to research Fred Hayes, H-A-I-S-E. Fred Hayes, 85 years young, He's a retired Apollo astronaut. And what I found out that was fascinating to me is he is the man who came closest to walking on the moon but never walked on the moon. Fred Hayes was part of five separate Apollo missions. Now, 12 men walked on the moon. Neil Armstrong was first. Gene Cernan was the 12th. Only 12 men, four of them still living, ever walked on the moon. Fred Hayes was part of Apollo 8. He was on the backup crew. For those of you that know, every Apollo mission had two crews, the one that flew and the one that backed up in case something happened to one of the other astronauts. So the backup crew had to be just as prepared as the crew that flew, <laughs> the, the flu crew. <laughs> and he was a backup crew member of Apollo 8. He was also a backup crew member of Apollo 11. In fact, Fred Hayes was the replacement for Buzz Aldrin. So if Buzz Aldrin had got sick or something happened to one of his kids or something he couldn't fly, Fred Hayes would have been the second man on the moon. But he wasn't. But then it looked like it was going to happen for Fred. He was on Apollo 13. Have you seen the movie? <laughs> Fred Hayes' character was played by the late Bill Paxton in the movie. So they didn't get to the moon on Apollo 13. They had some problems. Houston, we have a problem. And they had to come home, if you remember the movie. Apollo 16, he was also on the backup crew, but he didn't get to fly. And then it looked like it was going to happen for Fred. He was named the commander of Apollo 19. But for those of you that know history, Apollo 17 was the final mission to the moon. Apollos 18, 19, and 20 were canceled because of budget cuts and a changing cultural climate with the whole moon thing. So I, I, I learned a lot about this guy named Fred Hayes. Five separate Apollo missions. He almost made it to the moon, but he never got there. But I still didn't know why they would have selected him to be the keynote speaker at the NASA 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And then as I read the article, I understood. Here's an excerpt of what he said to the NASA employees, former astronauts, all those people. He said, I was in mission control when the Eagle landed. It was traditional for backup crews to be in mission control at what was called critical times. Obviously, the Apollo landing being one. With the possibility that we might be useful if something went wrong. I was back up on Apollo 8. 11 and 16, and I was never utilized. So I was just there, like anybody, just watching what was going on. Now, you want to talk about one of the greatest understatements in the world. I was just there, like anybody, just watching what was going on. Do you realize there's only 32 men in the history of the world that were on the Apollo? Only 32 men qualified. This is one of only 32. He says, I'm just there hanging out, just doing whatever. 
And what I realized as I read this article was Fred Hayes was the closest person to connect with 400,000 individuals to put men on. It took 400,000 people. Think about the people that made the space suits and the people that designed this and the people that did that. And of course, like we said last week, the people that made Tang. <laughs> Fred Hayes was just this everyday, ordinary guy. He was just there. He was just available. And here's what I got out of the article, and here's what I wanted to, to share. Most of us aren't going to go to the moon. I don't mean literally the moon. Most of us are never going to experience the things we think are really important. Most of us are never going to accomplish our goals. Most of us are never going to realize our dreams. We're going to go to the moon. And we train for it. And we eat it and sleep it and drink it. Write about it. Think about it. Drink. And then as life goes by, we realize it's not going to happen. I'm not going to make it. It's not going to work out. But what Fred Hayes did, which was genius, was he just kept making himself available. And by making ourselves available to God, we will experience more than we could ever dream, more than we could ever plan, more than we could ever do. And one day when we get to heaven, and maybe a little bit sooner for some of us if we could think, we're going to be able to look back and say, oh, I wanted to go to the moon. God had a better plan. Oh, I wanted to experience this, but God had a different plan. Oh, I wanted to have that, but God had another plan. And his plan was the best all along. And so when we come to this verse, we think, oh, God, would you just do this in my life? Or, oh, God, I want this for my life. Or, oh, God, I want this for my kids. But here's the question. Are we making ourselves available to God? God, I know you're able to do this. Would you do it? God, I know you're able to do that. Would you do it? God, I know you're able to do the other. Will you do it? But are we making ourselves available to God? Paul says God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, accordingly. And while we sit and we sit and we sit, and we sit, we wonder why God isn't doing something. When if we were making ourselves available to God, walking with Him, talking with Him, obeying Him, we would see God do things that are exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. This is what Paul is saying in this verse. God ability begins with availability. Here's the big question. I'm almost done. Thank you for your attention. Right now, right here, today, are you available to God? Are you available to God? Or do you say, well, wait a minute, God. Let me check my schedule and see if I can fit you in somewhere. Are you available to Him? God, here I am. I'm available. I'm open. I'm receptive. Whatever you want, here I am. I'm your man. I'm your woman. I'm your person. I sat down Friday night. It was late. I was tired. But I still had enough uh, of my wits about me to make a list of all the reasons people have given me over 30 plus years of ministry why they're not available to God, why they can't serve God. Here's some of them. I'm too old to serve God. I'm too young to serve God. I don't know enough to serve God. I served God once. I failed. I don't want that to happen again. I served God, but it didn't make a difference. I served, but I got my feelings hurt. I served God, but I didn't feel appreciated. I'm not healthy enough to serve God. I served God for a while. Now it's somebody else's turn. I'm too busy to serve God. I'll serve God someday. I don't know how to serve God. Hey, I'll just pray for others who are serving God. I just can't do what I used to. And if I can't do what I used to, I don't want to try. I've sinned too much to serve God. I need to clean up my life before I try. And then somebody told me one time, I just don't want to serve God. 
<laughs> this verse waits for people who say, I want to, I'm willing. Our availability, God's willingness, God's ability, our willingness, it all comes together in verse 21. Look at it with me. Now, unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Listen, God's got a work He wants to do through you. The old song says it this way, Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still.